My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in New York. Today's video is on the subject of pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism, otherwise called PE, is a common but very serious medical emergency that everyone should be aware of. In simplistic terms, a pulmonary embolism can be thought of as a lung attack. We talk about heart attacks in where there's disruption of the blood supply uh, to the heart, leading to the heart muscle cells being deprived of blood and dying. In a pulmonary embolism, there's disruption of the blood supply to the lungs, leading to death of lung cells. Blood is delivered to the lungs from the right heart uh, by these arteries called the pulmonary arteries. And the pulmonary arteries will divide and subdivide and subdivide further and make very small little vessels that perfuse all the lungs. Uh, once the blood gets into the lungs, it collects oxygen and then travels to the left heart, where that oxygen-rich blood is pumped to the brain and the rest of the body. If a blood clot were to get into the pulmonary arteries, then that blood clot would travel and then eventually get wedged in a, uh, a smaller artery, and it will block the passage of blood into that part of the, the lung, and that part of the lung will therefore die. In addition, there will be a sudden and significant reduction in the amount of oxygen collected by the blood because now you've got an area uh, of lung which is not getting any blood because that blood supply has been blocked. So that oxygen that is in the lung doesn't actually get into the bloodstream. And so there will be a sudden and significant reduction of the amount of blood, uh, amount of oxygen collected by the blood, and therefore there will be a profound drop in oxygen levels within the body. And obviously, all our tissues need oxygen, so if there's less oxygen, then other, other parts of our body start struggling as well. There will also be a significant reduction in the amount of blood getting into the left heart, because some of the blood that was going to go into the lungs and go from the lungs to the left heart is now stopped because of this obstruction and therefore less blood gets into the left heart and then when the left heart is pumping blood out it pumps out less blood and this will therefore cause the blood pressure to drop and can cause hemodynamic collapse and even death. Now by far and away the commonest mechanism for PE is the development of blood clots in the legs these are term, this is termed DVT, deep vein thrombosis in the legs, and then the blood clot which sits in the legs can then travel into the right heart. From the right heart, it, it gets um, pumped into the lungs where it gets stuck in one of these vessels causing this PE in the lungs. Although clot is by far the commonest mechanism, uh, you can also have PEs from anything else that causes an obstruction to the blood supply. Uh, and that can include fat cells, air, and cancer cells. And all of these can block the pulmonary vasculature and cause pulmonary emboli. How common is pulmonary embolism? It's very common. The incidence is anywhere between 40 and 120 people per 100,000 uh, uh, people in the population per year. And uh, the incidence of DVT is even commoner, so 50 to 160 people per 100,000 people per year. The incidence is higher in men compared to women, and in the US it is estimated that approximately 100,000 people die every year of a PE. And this is likely to be an underestimate, because when someone drops down dead, suddenly it is often assumed that the patient has died of a heart attack and a detailed uh, autopsy may not be undertaken. And it is quite possible that a bunch of these people could have died due to pulmonary embolism. And a timely diagnosis of pulmonary embolism is crucial because without treatment, up to 30% of patients will die. But if timely treatment is delivered, then that number drops to 8%. The question is, why should blood clots form in the first place? In general, there is a triad of factors. This is called Virchow's triad and consists of hypercoagulability. For some reason, the blood is more prone to clotting. Stasis, so the blood is more prone to clotting, but it is also not moving for some reason as swiftly as it should. And finally, endothelial injury, the wall of the vessel where this, this blood is, is in some way damaged or abnormal. And the combination of these three things, the stasis, the injury to the vessel wall, and the hypercoagulability uh, will increase the risk of blood clot formation. So wherever those three factors come together, 
there's a much higher risk of blood clot formation. Now, risk factors for pulmonary embolism can be subdivided into two groups, uh, genetic and acquired. In terms of genetic risk factors, it's usually some kind of genetic abnormality of the blood itself, which makes the blood more likely to clot. Uh, we refer to this a condition where the blood becomes more likely to clot as thrombophilia and there are a variety of different uh, thrombophilial um, uh, conditions. Uh, one of them is something called factor V laden mutation. Uh, there's something called protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, hyperhomocystinemia. All these give you a genetic vulnerability for uh, blood clot formation. And then there are acquired risk factors. So you may not have a genetic tendency, but something happens to you which makes it more likely for you to uh, become immobile, for your blood not to move as much, uh, for you to have endothelial injury. And those are particularly fractures of the lower limb, hip or knee replacement, hospitalization, prolonged hospitalization for any reason, but heart failure, trauma, uh, cancer, prolonged bed rest, uh, postpartum after childbirth, the oral contraceptive pill can increase the risk of blood clots, instrumentation of the big blood vessels with um, cannulae and central lines, etc., pregnancy, infection anywhere in the body, and we've seen this more uh, recently with COVID, and obesity, uh, amongst many others, but those are generally the common ones. What are the symptoms of pulmonary embolism? Well, perhaps the most important symptom is collapse or near collapse. So people, you know, are walking along and then if they have this, suddenly uh, they black out and they black out for two reasons. One, because they don't have any oxygen, so there's a lack of oxygen. And two, because there's a sudden drop in the amount of blood that's coming out of the left heart because it's all stuck in the lung. It's not able to get past the lung because of this blockage. And that will result in collapse or near collapse. Of course, breathlessness is another uh, very important feature. Chest pain. Uh, the pain in pulmonary embolism is different to the pain that we see in heart attacks. In heart attacks, the pain is described like an oppression or someone sitting on your chest. With pulmonary embolism, the pain is generally described as sharp and it's worse than breathing in. It's described as pleuritic pain, worse than breathing in and very sharp in nature. And then another symptom is also cough, uh, especially if that cough is coupled with the coughing of blood. Uh, so hemoptysis, uh, you know, a cough with blood in it, much more likely to uh, suggest pulmonary embolism. There are other causes, but those are the main features of pulmonary embolism. Of all these symptoms, collapse or near collapse are by far the most worrying because they indicate more severe or widespread pulmonary embolism. When we examine a patient with a suspected pulmonary embolism, we will find that their heart rate is usually fast, their breathing rate, their respiratory rate is fast, their blood pressure may be on the low side. In addition, there may be evidence of leg swelling and tenderness, which points to a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis in the legs, which if coupled with symptoms of breathlessness, make it much more likely that the patient has also had a PE. Occasionally, patients can have small PEs, which may not manifest as any specific symptoms, but over a period of time, ongoing damage caused by these recurring small PEs may lead to symptoms of increasing breathlessness and evidence of strain of the right heart as the right heart tries to get blood into the lungs and the amount of blood that's getting in is less and less and therefore the right heart has to work harder and harder to try and get this blood into the lungs and eventually the right heart gives up and this when the right heart gives up this is termed right heart failure and in right heart failure the right heart simply cannot get enough amounts of blood needed into the lungs and this extra blood that was supposed to go into the lungs sort of seeps out into the legs causing increased swelling of the legs, increased edema of the legs. And in some people, it can be so marked that it can extend all the way up to the groin and the sacrum. So this is right heart failure, and that's the mechanism behind it in pulmonary embolism. So when we have patients where um, we suspect pulmonary embolism, what tests should we do to confirm or refute a diagnosis? 
Well, a chest X-ray can be helpful. As blood is struggling to get into the lungs, we see very dark areas where the blood isn't getting in. And this, uh, these, this appearance is termed pulmonary oligemia, a lack of blood, because the blood simply isn't getting in that area. You don't, you see much more, uh, the, the radio, the lung fields look blacker. You know, it's, when you look at lung fields, you see sort of, oh, sort of white streaks, which is the blood in the blood vessels. But if there is no blood because all the blood has been obstructed, then a part of the lung may look very dark and that's suggestive. Uh, another thing uh, that we can do is measure the oxygen content of the blood. And this is done by uh, taking the blood directly from one of the arteries in the wrist and then you analyze it and the oxygen content in the blood is lowered in pulmonary embolism. And interestingly, even the carbon dioxide levels are lower because the patient is over breathing. They're trying to breathe really hard. They can't get enough oxygen in, but because they're breathing so hard, they're getting lots of rid of lots of carbon dioxide. So both their carbon dioxide levels are go down and their oxygen levels go down. Uh, Perhaps one of the most useful uh, rule out tests is a test called D dimer. Uh, D dimer is a blood test which measures the lead. So, D dimer is a, a compound that increases in the body when there is a thrombotic process going on. And it's possible, therefore, to take a bit of blood and then look for D dimer. And a normal D dimer is 95% sensitive for exclusion of a diagnosis of PE, especially if it is clinically felt that a PE is unlikely anyway. So a negative D-dimer is very reassuring in a low-risk patient. A positive D-dimer doesn't confirm the diagnosis, but does uh, make it uh, more uh, suspicious. And therefore, whenever there is a positive D-dimer, more tests are needed to exclude or, refute, uh, to exclude or confirm the diagnosis. When the D-dimer is found to be elevated, the next step is usually something called a CTPA or a CT pulmonary angiogram. And this is a CAT scan, a CT scan, which involves giving the patient contrast to fill the pulmonary arteries. And the clot is then seen as filling defects in this contrast as it fills the pulmonary artery. So you'll see uh, gaps in this contrast where the clot is sitting. Sometimes, if the clot is affecting the small vessels, especially on the peripheries of the lung, then a CTPA may miss the clot. And in those patients, if the clinical probability is high, then a VQ scan should be done. An echo or ultrasound of the heart can also be useful because it will tell us about the state of the right heart and may even allow us to calculate the pressures that have to be exerted by the right heart to get the blood into the lungs. If the pressures are elevated, then this is termed pulmonary hypertension. How do we treat it? Well, treatment depends on the status of the patient. If the patient is exceptionally breathless and the blood pressure is low and the oxygen levels are very low, then that patient is critically unwell and you have to deliver life-saving therapy. And at that point, it is recommended the patient be given immediate clot-busting medications. These are uh, very strong medications that dissolve blood clot. They do come with a much higher risk of bleeding, including fatal bleeding. But in this setting where there is no other option, you have to get that um, clot broken down. You have to allow the right heart to pump blood into the lung so that it can collect oxygen, etc. A thrombolytic, giving a thrombolytic can be a life-saving measure. This has to obviously be coupled with other supportive measures. So, you know, you want to give the patient lots and lots of oxygen, lots of intravenous fluid to keep that circulation going, even inotropic medications which help the heart to beat with more vigor. But you want to, at the same time, try and get rid of that clot. On the other hand, if the patient is stable and you've made the diagnosis of PE, then at the moment uh, it is felt that the risks of giving someone a thrombolytic may be excessively high in those patients. And in those patients, the mainstay of treatment is anticoagulation. That is given through either using warfarin or uh, agents called the DOAX or Eliquis, Xarelto, etc. All patients uh, who have had a PE should receive at least three months of uninterrupted anticoagulation therapy. Extending the anticoagulation therapy duration to lifelong 
may reduce the risk of recurrent PEs by almost 90%, although the benefits may to an extent be offset by the risk of bleeding from anticoagulation use. And therefore, one way to decide how long to anticoagulate the patient is to work out whether the PE was provoked, e.g. Uh, by surgery or something like that, or was unprovoked. Unprovoked PEs are associated with a two to threefold increase in, re increase in recurrence. Also, people who have persistent risk factors, so someone who's got terminal cancer or something like that, they're also at a much higher risk for recurrence. And in these patients, it is generally recommended that these patients be considered for lifelong anticoagulation. As the clot slowly dissipates, the right heart will have to work less hard and the right ventricular function may improve. Sometimes, however, the clot may be so large and may not dissolve despite the anticoagulation therapy, in which case a surgical option can be employed where the clot is mechanically fished out surgically. This is termed thrombectomy. As mentioned, a diagnosis and timely intervention are absolutely essential. 30% of patients with untreated PE will die compared to 8% of uh, patients who've received treatment in a timely manner. So if you know of someone who is complaining of the symptoms that I've described today, please ensure that they ask their doctor to exclude a PE. And if they're unwell, they should just go into hospital and get this checked out. I hope this helps. Um, and uh, once again, as always, I am so, so grateful uh, to you all for putting up with me uh, because um, I haven't been uh, particularly consistent with putting videos, but I am back now and I shall put some more on soon. Thank you so much. All the best.